Father Guy Consolmagno is the director of the Vatican Observatory. This is Tahoe, Tahoe Environmental Research Center. Nothing about the sea isn't for comments. It isn't for why do we have somebody from who's an astronomer? Astronomy Observatory. Vatican. Okay. Point one, this week, the past seeds are happening. So take advantage of Tahoe's dark skies. Uh, brother guy tells me to see them at their peak, you'll have to be up at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All this comes down, really, the, the link that brings brother guy here tonight um, is the Seki disc. 10 inch wide disc that uh, since continuously every month, literally every 10 days since, since 1968, has been measuring changes in the Tahoe's flaring. Have you ever wondered how it got that name? Secchi. Well, it's an Italian name. Secchi was an Italian astronomer. So there's one connection. But one of the things he did, and I, I don't want to sort of delve into what you're talking about, is as a side project, possibly, he came up with this idea of lowering, lowering a disk into a lake or into the ocean to measure how far down you can see. And so this Seki disk was invented by him. He was, as I, as I say, he was the first director of Vatican astronomy. He, he founded it. So Brother Guy is now following in his footsteps. Unfortunately, Father Seki did not come from the top. <laughs> I hope future directors will come. This will become a, a, an every, will become a frequent event. So Brother Guy comes to us highly distinguished. He, uh, he does not have any degrees from UC Davis. <laughs> Instead, he went to MIT, he went to the University of Arizona, he went to Harvard. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, he, <laughs> uh, he's had an amazing career. He's been in the Peace Corps in different parts of the world. He's been to Africa. I believe he's been to Antarctica. <laughs> all places. So I don't want to say any more than that, other than. It's a great honor that you made the time to come here. Uh, we're all looking forward to, to hearing about the amazing life of, uh, of both Brother Consumani and Angelo the second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Father Seki was a member of the Jesuit order. I'm a Jesuit brother. And the old joke is, how do you tell a Jesuit in Greenwich Village? He's the only one not wearing black. Um, I thought I should wear at least a black T-shirt to give this formal talk. And this is about eclipses. Today, I got to go out on the lake and see a Secchi disc in action. And I'd read about them. I'd heard about them. I always wondered about them. That's a disk galaxy, which is closer to what Angelo Secchi actually did. Angelo Secchi is probably the greatest scientist you've never heard of. And let's start about we're talking about the Secchi disk. The more common one has these black and white stripes. And the limnologists in the room can explain why you're only using a white one here and not a black and white one. I can't tell the difference. <clears throat> The idea is you put it on a string, you lower it into the water, the dirtier the water, the faster it becomes obscured from view. And it's very easy to measure how deep was it. You can see how long the rope is. It's very repeatable. Uh, the people here have told me that different people who have made the measurements get the same value regardless of who is making the measurements. The measurements can be made by anybody. <clears throat> In fact, this is a great, you know, popular, popular a public science project. If you've got high school kids or Boy Scout troops or Girl Scout troops who want to do a project in science in their neighborhood, looking at the clarity of the water and what this means, anybody can do it. You can put the data online and anybody else can reference the data because we all understand what it means. There are millions of these measurements available online. There are millions of these measurements that go back 150 years because the one measurement by itself is interesting, but seeing how it changes with time, that's where you really get an idea of how your lakes are evolving, <clears throat> what's going on 
Are things changing quickly or slowly? And why might they be changing? Remarkably stable results. Even though <clears throat> there are all sorts of other variables you think would uh, call you, know, is, this, is the sea rough? Is the sun uh, you know, light or, or dark? It turns out those things really don't matter. There have been all of these citizen projects. I, I just put one here, the Seki Dip-In, which is a volunteer program started 1994, which sounds recent to me, but uh, people tell me that it was 30 years ago. <laughs> and so it's both a popular as well as a scientific way of measuring the clarity of lake water. So how did Angelo Secchi get connected to this? It all started with a guy named Alessandro Cialdi, who was uh, the commander of the Pope's Navy. In the 1860s, the Holy See was still an independent nation, recognized as an independent nation. At that point, as we'll describe, it was just Rome and the area around Rome. The big port in Rome is Civ Civ <clears throat> Civitavecchia. And they were worried about you know, going in and out of Rome. He was interested in the ecology of the area. And he invited Angelo Secchi, who was a well-known scientist working at you know, <clears throat> the Roman college, the Jesuit college that was in the city of Rome and therefore well-known to the popes. And he said, come on out, you know, spend a month on the boat with us. One afternoon, Secchi is seeing what he's trying to do and he says, why don't you just get like <clears throat> a big disc, a car of canvas, paint it white, lower it in the, in the sea and see what happens. In fact, the idea had been around before. What other captains would do was to take a, a plate from uh, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the boat's china shop or whatever, put it in a net and lower it. The thing that makes Seki special, and here's a lesson for the students in the room, he wrote it up. He analyzed it, <clears throat> he published it, and he addressed all of the different questions that might come up. Well, how would this work? How would that work? If you don't write it down, it didn't happen. <laughs> and he was very good at writing papers. Now, the Seki disc originally was a, a white disc. And of course, that's the kind that we use here in the lake. <clears throat> the interesting thing is the stripes were added by a fellow named Whipple around 1900. And that was about the time that the French scientist who invented the term limnology, and so I guess, in a sense, invented the field, knew the history of the Secchi disc, and he gave it the name Secchi disc. <clears throat> so here's this marvelous picture of uh, Chaldi, <clears throat> the boat that they were on, and Father Secchi. One interesting thing about this picture, if you ever look up Secchi on the internet or look uh, in, <clears throat> in other you know, tomes of the history of science, you will often see his name given as Piero Angelo Secchi. That's wrong. He would sign his name as P. Dot Angelo Secchi. The P stands for Padre, that he was a priest. <clears throat> and that's all it meant. And where the, of all the names that you could use, start with a P, why people decided it was Piero. <laughs> It's one of those mistakes that gets into the literature and is very hard to get out again. And it even you know, showed up in this picture that I found. So let me tell you a little bit about Angelo Secchi and how it happened that I actually know something about him. He was an Italian, he was a Jesuit, and he was born in 1818. So for his bicentennial of his birth, a number of books were prepared. The first one in Italian, <clears throat> by uh, a member of our observatory in Rome. And like most things about Secchi, it was in Italian. Nobody could read it except the Italians. <clears throat> Ileana Canici, who is a historian of science and an adjunct member of the Vatican Observatory, which is to say we don't pay her salary, but we give her all the rights and privileges. She can come up and use our library and use all of our resources and go into our, <clears throat> our archives, do whatever she needs to do and use our name when she publishes. She got a contract to write a biography of Secchi in English, even though she's Italian. And it was due to come out in 1818. Well, of course, it came out in 18, 
and it was supposed to come out in 2018. It came out around 2020, 2019. It actually won the History of Science uh, Division of the American Astronomical Society's Award for Best History of Science Book of the Year. And I know this book intimately because she wrote it in English, and then I translated her English into English. <laughs> so she did all the work, and I had the fun of turning it into, you know, really, because it was a great story and wonderful prose. Uh, connected with that, she also got a contract with from Springer to organize a conference out of which another book about Secchi science was published. <clears throat> and this came out just last year, 2022. Every chapter is by an author or a couple of authors who are an expert in a different field that Secchi was involved in. And you'll hear there are a lot of fields and a lot of chapters. Some of them were written in Italian, some were written in English by Italians. So once again, I had the fun of doing the translating. The ones written in Italian were a whole lot easier because I had a better idea of what it was they thought they were saying. <laughs> and I'm a co actually a co-editor of that book. What do we know about Angelo Secchi? He was born in a little town called Reggio Emilia in 1818. On the 28th of June, we've got his baptismal certificate, Piero does not appear anywhere there. It's Angelo. Now, most of you probably have never heard of the town of Reggio Emilia. It's um, not a small town, but it's not a big town either, uh, a bit north of Bologna. Does anybody here, have you ever heard of the Don Camillo stories or the Don Camillo movies? They were really popular in the 50s and 60s. Don Camillo was right from Reggio Emilia. <laughs> That was the town that, that was being described in those books and those movies. And if you ever get a chance to see the movies, they're really funny. <laughs> it, it, it's a long story I won't even get into. Um, at the age of about 15, he decides to become a novice of the Society of Jesus. And this, you know, for a man, a usually sort of middle-class kid, <clears throat> his parents were educated. This was a way of getting a much better education and also fulfilling a, a desire to be a priest. So he's shown to be quite clever, and they give him extra courses in physics. And he is studying to be a physics teacher, either at a high school, which he teaches at the high school in Loreto for a while. Um, you may have heard of Loreto. That's the place that has the house that supposedly angels brought from the Middle East. <clears throat> it's in The house exists. That's the weird thing. <clears throat> and it really is a Middle Eastern house. And how it got to Loreto you know, angels bringing it is as reasonable as any other story I've heard. More likely, it was a family named Angelo who brought it back, but who cares? The, the house is there. And they had a Jesuit high school, and he taught high school there. He then went off to Rome to finish his theology studies to become ordained a priest. And in 1847, he's ordained. He's about 20, 27, <clears throat> uh, 29 years old. 1848 is a really interesting year in the history of Europe. Everything falls apart. There are revolutions across Europe. The, uh, the, the kingdom of France falls. Germany starts to become unified. Garibaldi marches on Rome and kicks the Pope out of Rome. The Pope has to flee to Naples. Once he takes over Rome, the Jesuits are expelled. Angelo Secchi, being a young Jesuit, uh, on the one hand, because he's a Jesuit, means that he has to, to worry about the politics of people who are anti-clerical. But the other hand, it also means there are lots of places he can go. So the first place he goes is to a boarding school in the north of England called Stonyhurst. <clears throat> and there he discovers they've got a telescope. So he learns, you know, he's a physicist, but he learns how to use a telescope. He's there for about six months. And then he's got a more permanent job found for him at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And he's there for about a year and a half. And while he's there, he not only learns more about astronomy because they've got a telescope, he meets a fellow named Maury who is inventing meteorology in a lot of ways. Uh, <clears throat> he was also, Maury was a, he was a vicious racist and, you know, eventually fought for the Confederacy, but never mind that. He also, Norrie, took the records of American ships around the world 
<clears throat> describing the weather that day to map out weather patterns showing that there were cyclonic patterns in the north and the south and trade winds at the equator <clears throat> and that if you know the weather in the west you can predict what the weather is going to be in the east and nowadays in 1848 we have the telegraph so we can have people in the west telling us what kind of weather they have and begin to try to figure out what the weather is going to be in the east Secchi is doing all of this while he's there. In July of 1849, the French army marches into Rome, kicks out Garibaldi's army, and gives Rome and the environs around Rome back to the Pope <clears throat> to be his nation, the nation still called the Holy See. And the French keep their army there because they're basically the French don't like the Italian government and they don't like the German government and the Germans don't like the Italians and Germany. <clears throat> this is Europe. <clears throat> At that point, Secchi is told he can come back to Rome. He comes back to Rome. He's like 31 years old now. And the fellow who had previously been teaching astronomy at the Roman college, at the Jesuit college in Rome had died in the meanwhile. So they named Secchi the director of the observatory. Now, mind you, Secchi is not an astronomer. He's a physicist. And this is <clears throat> makes all the difference. <clears throat> the first thing they offer is there's this beautiful tower on the uh, big tall tower on the, the, the school building where he's going to be teaching. How would you like to make that your observatory? And he goes, are you nuts? Towers shake in the wind. I'm not going to try to put a telescope on top of a tower that's going to be rocking back and forth. You're never going to be able to aim the telescope at anything. I need some place that is high enough that I can see across the city <clears throat> limits, but stable enough that it's not going to move. And oddly enough, right next to the Jesuit school is a church, the Church of St. Ignatius. On the, <clears throat> my right, your left, you see the dome, beautiful dome of the church. On my left, your right, you see the roof of the church and you don't see a dome. The church was designed back in the 1600s by a fellow named Orazio Grassi, who was a great rival of Galileo's and the first man to see a, a comet through a telescope. And Grassi had designed a church to have a beautiful dome. But for a number of reasons, the simplest being that they ran out of money, they never built the dome. So instead, they just put in a flat ceiling and then hired another Jesuit, this time a brother <clears throat> named Pozzi, <clears throat> to paint the dome in perspective <clears throat> on the flat ceiling. If you ever get to Rome and you can go into this church and you're standing in the front door and you look and you go, well, well this has got to be the wrong church because that's a real dome. It really looks like a real dome unless you're standing directly underneath it, which is where that picture was taken. And that's what it looks like from directly underneath. <laughs> but what it means is there were four pillars to carry the weight of the dome and no dome on them. And Secchi says, I'm gonna put my telescope on those four pillars. <laughs> this is a diagram of the different telescopes that he had. The biggest being the, the Mertz Equatorial Telescope. You can see a sort of a cut view. And then there was a refractor and a meridian telescope, which was basically just used to measure the positions of stars. Because what did astronomers do in the 1840s? <clears throat> Why did anybody have astronomy? Astronomy was very practical. You needed it for timekeeping and you needed it for navigation. In both cases, you wanted to know exactly where the star was so that when you measure in, in, in terms of an absolute uh, scale, so that when you see where the star is right now, compared to the absolute scale, you can calculate where you are and what time it is. And so people like Bowditch had put together big tables of the positions of you know, important stars. But you had to measure these stars star by star, waiting for the star to exactly cross the meridian and then seeing how high up in the sky they were. And you would measure the time when it fit exactly in the meridian. To this day, star positions are given in terms of an angle called the declination, up or down. And instead of uh, longitude 
astronomers use something called our angle, which is the position that <clears throat> the position they would the, the time that they would cross the meridian on one of the equinoxes, basically. And that's what astronomers were supposed to do. But Secchi had one of these beautiful German telescopes that he installed, and he's a physicist, and he's interested in more than just measuring the positions of stars, which, as you can imagine, is incredibly boring to do. That's why they're paying you, but it's incredibly boring. That was the beautiful te telescope that he installed, which was one of the best telescopes in the world in the 18, you know, 1850s. That's a photograph, actually, of what the roof of the church looked like as late as 1904. Uh, the telescopes, of course, had a sad history, but we'll get to that towards the end. That's what's on the roof of the church uh, today. I took these pictures 20 years ago, but nothing's changed. You can see the ruins of the telescope, and that's where the telescope used to be. Um, spoiler alert, the Italians eventually conquered Rome and confiscated the telescope. But you can see that's the view that you had. So you're above most of the buildings. And if you know Rome, that's the, that's the Pantheon there, just across the street. And the Trevi Fountain is just up the street in the other direction. So he's right in the center of Rome. It's a great place. Also, from there, he could measure when the sun was crossing exactly the meridian. At that point, he would lower a big black ball and the army across the way, <clears throat> the Carinale, would fire off a cannon when they saw the ball go down, and everybody in Rome knew it was noon. Of course, that was, you know, the, the 19th century. We don't lower balls to mark time anymore, unless you're in Times Square on New Year's. That's where that idea came from. But Secchi is inter interested in more than just, you know, stars and timekeeping. About the time that he took over, there was a wonderful solar eclipse, hence my eclipse t-shirt. I hope you all know about the great eclipse that's going to happen on the 8th of April next year. Sadly, in the Midwest, you won't be able to see much of it here. But if you have a chance to go east, make your travel plans now. In fact, it may already be too late. <clears throat> but if you have never seen an eclipse, you got to see one. Anyway. He went to Spain, where there was this marvelous you know, eclipse visible, and being a modern scientist, he brought with him a photographic camera, and he photographed the eclipse. As you probably know, an eclipse is going to have the, uh, the moon blocking out the sun, and when that happens, you can see this corona, the very hot gases around the sun. How do you know? that those are hot gases around the sun. How do you know that that's not just something in the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, that, you know, that, that is blurring the light? Nobody knew for sure until Secchi and an Englishman photographed the same eclipse at more or less the same time, but from a distance of several hundred kilometers apart, and they saw the same corona. So that was very important science in the nature of how the sun works. Secchi got really interested in the sun after this and started making measurements of sunspots and solar activity and solar coronas and invented a disk so you could block out the sun in your telescope at any time. <clears throat> and he had a special telescope set up for observing the sun. <clears throat> These are his drawings of sunspots in the fine detail. These are modern images made by the, the great Swedish telescope in La Palma that observes the sun. You can see that he was observing with the human eye a lot of the detail of what was going on in the sun and recognizing that the number of sunspots was connected to the amount of solar activity, the amount of <clears throat> prominences, the, the size of the corona. The other thing that he also measured being a physicist and having an observatory was the magnetic field of the earth, how strong it was, what its direction was. And he discovered that there was a correlation between solar activity and the earth's magnetic field, which in the 1850s, 
uh, there was an enormous solar storm that knocked out uh, tra telegraph transmission <clears throat> around the world. If there were to be an event like that, like it's called the Carrington event, nowadays, 200 years later, it would probably wipe out an awful lot of the electrical grid system that we have today. It's a very rare event, but he saw the connection. In order to keep track of solar activity, because it actually affects our radio waves and our, <clears throat> our grids that you know, distribute electricity, NASA has two spacecraft looking at the sun from two different directions, which contain an instrument called the Sun-Earth Connection Coronal and Heliospheric Investigation Package. So the Secchi disk is not the only thing bearing Secchi's name. You know, when you become a NASA acronym, there is fame. Um, I don't think they're ever going to come up with an acronym for Consul Magno, but uh, <laughs> only because the word's too long, what can I say? But go back to astronomy. Secchi is doing all of these interesting things about the sun. Nonetheless, astronomy in those days, to, to quote, <clears throat> Pull this out so I can actually <clears throat> read my. Uh... What astronomy must do has always been clear. It lays down the rules for determining the motions of heavenly bodies as they appear to us. Everything else that can be learned about the heavenly bodies is not properly of astronomical interest. We're being paid to measure the orbits of the planets and the positions of the stars. That's what we're being paid to do, nothing else. <clears throat> because after all, every research in relation to the stars not reducible to simple visual observations is barred to us. We can never study, we can never know the composition of a star because we can't get there, get a piece of it and bring it back to our laboratories. So we can never even think about what our star is made out of. There is an entire class of knowledge that we know must exist. The stars must be made of something, but we know we will never know. And this was the great French philosopher Kant. <clears throat> well, that's 1835. That's Bessel, 1832. Stacke, being a physicist, has heard about <clears throat> Fraunhofer who has glowing gases and puts the light through a prism and has discovered that each chemical element will either emit or absorb particular colors in the spectrum. And somebody even looked at the sun and found lines of an element unseen on earth, which they called helium, helios being the sun, and somebody even took the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, and looked at that and said, oh, that's interesting. And then did nothing else with it. Secchi builds a prism that will fit over the main lens of his telescope so that every dot of starlight becomes a rainbow. And he measures by eye, recording by hand, the spectra of 5,000 stars. And in the process, discovers that the spectra can be divided. They're not all the same, but they're not each one unique. You can divide them into four or five or six different categories. So these are you know, the diverse types of stellar spectra. One of the tables in one of his books, and you can see some lines that are common, some that are not. A particular kind of star that looks with a spectrally very different has exactly the lines that he knows represents carbon. And those happen to be really, really deep red stars. Uh, Secchi loved deep red stars. Anybody who's an amateur astronomer has you know, found there <clears throat> a few really wonderful ruby stars that you can see in your telescope. <clears throat> They're deep red. This is the beginning of an entire new way of doing astronomy. Before him, astronomy was the, answering the question, where are the stars? After him, astronomy is asking the question, what are the stars? And he's using physics to answer that question. This is called astrophysics. 
Spectral, this is what he writes in 1863. <clears throat> spectral studies of celestial bodies aren't just out of curiosity, but it depends on the solution of many important cosmic questions. What is the nature of the matter that makes up the atmospheres of these stars? How can we measure the proper motions of the stars? Because he recognizes that if the stars are moving, then the lines will appear to be shifted one way or another, what we call the Doppler shift. You can measure the actual physical velocity of stars by measuring their spectra. And he knew that in 1860. That's how we're measuring and you know, discovering planets today. That's how we know that the universe is expanding by looking at this spectral shift. And he knew that in 1863. Fixing the proper colors of the stars and their corresponding brightnesses can be used to help classify stars, to try to figure out if there's a pattern between the star's brightness and the star's type. <clears throat> this ultimately leads to what the astronomers called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. <clears throat> and this is the basis of all astrophysics. And you can do this with a prism, or you can do it by photometry, which is to say, you look at your field of stars with a red filter and then a blue filter and then a green filter and measure the relative brightnesses of particular colors. And you can do an entire field of stars at once rather than <clears throat> having to, you know. And he knew all of this in the 1860s. He wrote this up in a book that he wrote in French when it was submitted and papers were submitted to the journal Nature. <clears throat> Norman Lockyer, who was the uh, editor of Nature, said, uh, this stuff is wrong. Not only that, he wasn't the first to say it. He stole it from somebody else. And not only that, but my friends in England are going to publish just the same thing in a year or two. So why do we have to pull it, you know, pay attention to this priest? His works were never published in English because Norman Lockyer, the editor of Nature, refused to allow them to be published in English. Nonetheless, other scientists, including English scientists, recognize that this is a completely new and distinctive form of astronomy. Geometry and mechanics are being replaced by chemistry and physics. For us old-fashioned astronomers, it's difficult to recognize for its ideas, its methods, its goals, and even the spirit which it reigns are very different from ours. It is the case of applying an important law, that of the division of work. The two sciences, physical astronomy and classical astronomy, have to develop in parallel without getting in each other's ways. And of course, there were a number of, of other scientists who wound up doing the same work, but much later than <clears throat> from the 18, 1870s and onward. But Secchi was there in the 1860s. He did something else. I'm a planetary scientist. I don't study stars, I study planets. Secchi, with his beautiful telescope, looked at Mars and the other planets. And he asked the question, not where are they? How can we measure the positions of the planets? But what are they? This is what the disk of Mars looks like to me when Mars was really close. He writes a book in uh, 1859, I think. <clears throat> 1859, on the physics of the solar system, which really is the very first book in planetary science, because the entire book is spent trying to describe not where are the planets and how can we calculate their orbits to another decimal place, but what are the planets? And he makes a fascinating and correct observation, which is misinterpreted, Looking at the light and dark areas, he says, you know, those dark areas seem like channels. He uses the Italian word canali. The thing that he sees are real. A generation later, another Italian astronomer who is brilliant and managed to get everything wrong, Schiaparelli, also thinks he's seeing thin lines which turn out to be optical illusions and calls them canali. And then the American Percival Lowell thinks that those are actually canals made by Martians. And H.G. Wells writes a book called The War of the Worlds based on that. So science fiction comes out of this as well.
In 1870, Germany, Bismarck, invades France. This is a trick to get Bavaria to join Germany. The French, seeing that Paris is imperiled, pulls their army out of Rome. So in September of 1870, Garibaldi marches back into Rome. The Pope's troops, who are pretty small, <clears throat> flee to the Vatican. At that point, there is a ceremonial fight as several gunshots, bullets are exchanged. And then the Italian government says, we won't try to capture the Pope. We'll let you stay there. And the Pope says, I am still the head of an independent country, even though it's just the Vatican and the territory, you know, the wall around St. Peter's. The Italians refuse to accept that. The rest of Rome has been captured. Secchi's observatory is now captured. He's a priest, and one of the laws of Italy is that all church property is now confiscated by the government. Which is one of the best things that ever happened to the church, because it means to this day, the Italian government has to pay for the maintenance of all the churches in Italy. Secchi is being threatened to be kicked out of his job but his international reputation outside of England is so strong that the Italian government realizes it would be a black eye to them if they did this. So he's allowed to continue doing his work. Finally, a law is confirmed in 1876, but sadly he dies in 1878 at the age of 59. I haven't even gone into the other things that Secchi did. <clears throat> um, working with the, uh, the Holy See government he was the fellow who plotted the meridian for Rome uh, down the Appian Way. He was the one who worked out you know, the latitude and longitude. <clears throat> he set up the time system in Rome. He sets up the meteorological system in Rome. <clears throat> he uh, works with the, the European meteorological system so that you can predict weather from one side to another. He works out a system of making buildings in the Roman area earthquake proof. He works out a system <clears throat> We're working out um, standard time. And in fact, standard time was a brand new thing that came about because of the need for the railroads to have schedules. It made sense. Standard time was explained to the people of Italy, not just Rome, in the churches, through using instructions <clears throat> that came from Secchi, including the idea that the day doesn't start at sunset anymore. The day starts at midnight. He does all, he, he works out um, sewage systems so that you don't get you know, yellow fever and malaria and what's the other, um, typhoid in the cities that are growing in, in Italy. He does all of this by the time he's 59. Scapidelli, who I you know, made some, uh, Scapidelli was a brilliant scientist. He just made a lot of bad <clears throat> conclusions from good data and very forgivable. But Scapidelli, this is his notebook. And in the bottom, he writes, while I was making these observations, at 7.15 Rome time, Father Secchi died. Thus has Italy been deprived of its principal and most distinguished astronomer. He died of cancer, as it turns out. <clears throat> Secchi was interested in the weather. One of the things you want to be able to do when you're measuring the weather is to have an accurate measurement of the weather. Up until that time, how did you do that? You hired some grad student to read the bar barometer and the thermometer and the anemometer and write it down on a piece of paper every hour or so. And Secchi saying, you know, we've invented electricity by now. We have magnets, we have wires. We can use machinery to make these records. And he invents this marvelous gizmo that he calls the meteorograph. He presents it at the Paris Expedition in 1867, wins a gold medal, and the Legion of Honor. This is really what made his reputation throughout Europe. And there were machines like this that were built and set up at meteorological stations all around the world. There was one that was set up in Cuba. I think they still have it. It might be one of the last that is in <clears throat> Of course, it's in the, the hands of the Cuban government. There was one like this in the Philippines. There are machines like this around the world. 
At that time, with that reputation, Secchi is invited by the French, who remember don't like the Italians, to come to a big meeting that they're holding in 1867 to reform the metric system. And the metric system had been set up in the French Revolution, but by the 1860s, details of exactly how long is a meter, exactly how much is a, is a, a kilogram, there had to be a new revisement, <clears throat> revised and, and more careful measurement. What were the issues involved? Well, every nation in Europe, which of course the only nations that counted, were invited to send a representative to a big conference. Secchi went as the representative of the Holy See, and he was put in charge of one of the principal committees. Call in 1870, it was called the Committee of 1870. <clears throat> And then in 1870, as we saw, there was the fall of Rome. 1872, they're doing the next meeting in Paris. Remember, Secchi is still allowed to be the astronomer there. So they ask him to come and continue the work of the committee. At that point, the Italians are objecting. Now, the Italian scientists knew that Secchi was a great scientist, but the Italian government <clears throat> decided to interfere. <clears throat> And this is a telegram that the minister plenipotentiary in Paris sent to the French foreign minister. Father Secchi was sent here to take part in the work of the commission of the meter. He was received as a representative of the Holy See. Please make known to me if there is a place to ask for explanations from the French government to express our reservations because the Holy See no longer exists and it's no longer an independent country. The Italian delegates say, don't do this. He's really important. We're going to come out looking stupid, but it's government. The government of the King of Italy cannot let pass in silence the designation made in the French official gazette of a state that no longer exists. The Italian delegates are instructed by the government to protest. The delegates decide to take a vote. Do we keep Secchi? Or do we keep the Italians? They keep Secchi. <laughs> Italy is kicked off the standing committee. When Secchi gets back to Rome, he's met by Pope Pius IX. When he walks into the room, the Pope raises his hand and he says, I vote for Father Secchi. <laughs> what this means, of course, is that the Vatican government now recognizes the power of having a scientist of international repute as a way of being recognized as a nation, something that Italy won't do until 1929. And that is a key part for why I've got a job today at the Vatican Observatory. Because you see, Secchi was the director of the Roman College Observatory and a Jesuit. But in 1887, the next Pope, Leo XIII, wanted to celebrate his 50th anniversary of being ordained. And Secchi, a uh, former uh, assistant, Father Denza, said, among other things, let's have a display of all the scientific instruments that are being made by priests in Italy this will show the world that the church is not anti-science. They put together this exhibit, and then Saki Denza says, we've, we've got all these cool things. Why don't we hold on to them and actually set up an astronomical observatory in memory of Father Saki? So in 1891, Leo XIII, whose coat of arms by coincidence has a comet in it, says we're going to set this up so that everyone might see clearly that the church and her pastors are not opposed to true and solid science, human or divine, but they embrace it, encourage it, and promote it with the fullest possible devotion. If you <clears throat> will indulge me, but I'm going to probably go a little bit over, but notice what's not in this statement is anything about the Holy See being represented as a nation. They don't say that out loud because they don't want to admit that it's even a question. And it's not the only reason for having an observatory. It's to show the world the church is not anti-science. Why in, in 1891 was this an issue? Why is it an issue today? 
where did this idea come from? Science was done at the universities and until, you know, the uh, about 1800, virtually all universities were organized and run by the church, which were teaching science. You say, oh, well, that was that Galileo thing. If you read the history of Galileo, and there's plenty of histories out there, you find out that everything you think you know about Galileo is wrong. The truth does not make the church look any better, <clears throat> but it well, the Galileo affair was not the church being anti-science. Quite the contrary. There have been a lot of church people who are great scientists, going back to, you know, um, uh, you know Thomas Aquinas and the guy who taught Thomas Aquinas, um, <clears throat> Albert the Great, wrote the first book of geology during the Middle Ages. <clears throat> there are plenty of monks in the Middle Ages who talked about this. Into modern times, we've got, you know, the inventor of genetics was uh, Mendel, <clears throat> who was a monk. An Augustinian monk. Most of us have these little cell phones that we have a, a charger for them, and on the charger it says so many amps and so many volts. Who was Ampere? A very devout Catholic from France. Who was Volta? A very devout Catholic from Italy. Everything that we do in the modern world ultimately is based on Maxwell's equations. Who is James Clerk Maxwell? A very devout Anglican. <clears throat> the Big Bang Theory was invented by a Catholic priest named George Lemaitre. And it was opposed by atheists who thought that the idea that the universe had a beginning sounded too biblical. And Fred Hoyle among them made fun of it by calling it the Big Bang Theory to, make, to, to come up with what he thought would be a silly name. So why did people think the church was anti-science? What was going on at the end of the 19th century? There was the technological advances in steam engines and electricity and the idea that every day in every way we're going to get smarter and better and progress is inevitable and we can put all of these old ideas behind us. The idea is called Whiggism. The idea is that science and technology will solve all of our problems. And the more technology and the more sophistication in our technology, the more we can improve the human race. In fact, we can take Darwin's very interesting and probably pretty good theory of evolution and use it in a practical way, first of all, to explain why people who don't look like me are inferior and therefore deserve to be poor, but even better, to improve the human race by only allowing people who look like me to breed. <clears throat> It was called eugenics. And if you think that was a horrible 19th century idea, Richard Nixon was still running eugenics programs, sterilizing women, mostly minorities, as late as the 1970s. The great answer to all of this idea was, of course, Nazi Germany, which had the most technologically sophisticated death camps that the world has ever seen. But that was in the future. In the 1890s, every pop scientist was saying this was the wave of the future. And the only people opposing these ideas were not the scientists, but the people who said, I don't care if this is true, and turns out it's not, but this is horribly immoral. And if you said it was immoral, you were caused, ah, you're being anti-scientific. This was the Pope's way of saying, no, we're not anti-scientific. We just have a real problem with this idea. And <clears throat> I could go on for hours, but instead buy my book that comes out next month. <laughs> what the Pope does do is he sets up the observatory. This is the entire Vatican city state. And there's a tower there with telescopes and a couple of other telescopes on the walls. <clears throat> the best and most modern of equipment for 1900. One of the programs, this is Father Giuseppe Lace, <clears throat> has a telescope that was designed to photograph the sky because the French, remember the French, <clears throat> hated the Italians, decided to have a program where every national observatory would photograph its own piece of the sky. And Italy was in, invited to give, you know, take a piece of the sky and the Vatican was invited 
equally to have its own piece of the sky. That was the camera that he used. That's the telescope which exists even to this day. And if you want, you can come out to the Vatican Observatory and you know, arrange to use the telescope for a small fee paid to the museums, not to us. That's the chart that came out of the carte de ciel. <clears throat> not only could you photograph the map, but then you could measure the positions of each of those stars. Who did the measurements? <clears throat> These computers, sisters. <clears throat> because of course, this was the kind of tedious work that you give if not to grad students then to women. That was the mentality of the day, but they did phenomenal work. They measured the positions of half a million stars. <clears throat> Finally, in 1929, Italy recognizes the Vatican, gives them back the, the Pope's summer home. The Pope builds telescopes on the roof. This is where he's dedicating the telescopes. <clears throat> they also have a laboratory where finally they get back to spectra again and they measure the spectra of every element in the periodic table and publish it in a journal called Spectra Chimica Octa, which is published at the Vatican after the war, because it's the only printing press that was available for publishing scientific journals. And to this day, the work of the observatory is interested in the spectra of carbon stars, the spectra of peculiar stars like lambda boo stars, <clears throat> the photometric colors of trans-Neptunian objects. So don't look at that ugly disk up there. Look at that tiny dot. That's the interesting thing. <clears throat> the spectra of open clusters using photometry. So this is a long way from the ocean, but there is one final connection. That particular galaxy is of type where stars have been ripped out of the galaxy by a second passing galaxy. And because of the shape and the peculiar stream, these are called jellyfish galaxies. I don't think there are any jellyfish in the lake here, but certainly we're back to the oceans again. So there is that connection between stellar spectroscopy and the deep sea. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> And if you want to know what want to know more about us, look up vaticanobservatory.org on the internet. Um, do we have time for questions? So um, if you've got a question, any kind of question, feel free to stand up and, and shout. And um, if I don't want to answer it, I'll tell you. But I'll do my best. And you can ask anything about whether it's the observatory, um, SECI, the history of, of limnology. I'll turn over to one of the people here who knows more about that than I do. <clears throat> or any other question about the Vatican Observatory. Now is your chance. Yes. Do we coordinate with other observatories? Uh, do we coordinate with other observatories? Yeah. So you have to tell us uh, tell yeah. your work. <clears throat> and how does the web affect our work? It's an interesting thing. There are two cameras in the Webb telescope that were designed by a husband and wife team, Marsha and George Rieke, who are at the University of Arizona and who taught at our summer school in 1993. <clears throat> we are at the University of Arizona, as well as in Rome. We've got a telescope outside of Tucson on Mount Graham, which is part owned by the University of Arizona and part owned by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. Because we don't compete with other scientists for grants, we are very popular in being asked by granting organizations to judge other grants. <clears throat> We also wind up getting elected to various offices. The fellow, I, I hate to say this because it's gonna raise a lot of eyebrows. The fellow who wrote the definition of a planet was a Jesuit priest working with the International Astronomical Union. At the IAU, I'm the guy in charge of nomenclature for the surface of Mars. <clears throat> and I'm the incoming up, you know, I'm the current vice president, soon to be president of the Meteoritical Society. Each of us, we've got 12 astronomers in 12 different fields of astronomy, all of us with doctorates from you know, major universities around the world. We come from four continents, Asia and Africa and Europe and Americas. And we all collaborate with scientists at universities. So we are directly plugged into 
the same astronomy as everyone else. And uh, when there is a cause for our work to be using the web, we will, just as we have had people who have gotten time in the Hubble. Other questions? Um, yes. That's a great question and a really good one. There are two Vatican's. There is the Holy See, which is kind of the church side, but then there's also something called the Vatican City State. And this is the part that runs the, that what makes the Vatican an independent nation. Now, there's only, like only less than a thousand people who are actually employed at the Vatican, so it's a really tiny state, but there's a lot of functions they still have to do. The Vatican Observatory's budget, which comes to, uh, including the salaries of the lay people, <clears throat> comes to about two to three uh, million euros a year. <clears throat> The euro is about the same as a dollar. That comes from the city state. All of the money of the city state, most all of it, comes from revenue generated by the Vatican Museum. You can imagine what happened to us during the year of COVID when our entire eighty percent of our budget just evaporated. But it means when you're in church and you're throwing in for your Peter's pence, no, I don't get that money. <clears throat> that goes to the Holy See where they, they do religious type stuff and <laughs> helping the poor and things like that. The telescope in America, as I say, is owned by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. And that's a 5013C, you know, <clears throat> uh, corporation, nonprofit corporation. One of the hats I wear is raising money for the foundation. <clears throat> so I know that. There's a lot of good science that depends on philanthropy. A lot of good science that I saw here today that depends on philanthropy. And we're very respectful of the people who are able to support us. Um, the people who mostly you know, give money to the foundation tend to be Catholics who are engineers. So that's a slightly different group than probably the people who are you know, supporting this group, though I'm sure there's an overlap. And wherever the money goes, if it's going to try to understand the truth, then you know it's it's helping us to get closer to the truth, which from my point of view means closer to God. So it's all <clears throat> well well spent, well deserved. Yeah. <clears throat> I noticed that uh, many of the results that you showed from uh, Stachy's observations were hand drawn. Mm -hmm. um, was uh, photographic technology available to him at any point during his working life, uh, or was uh, technology postdated his, his activity? Using photography at the telescope was just about 10 years after his death. It started in the 1880s. And that's why in 1891, the idea of photographing star positions was a new and crazy idea. The first photographs are actually photographs of comets. And in the comet pictures, people noticed, oh, you can see stars too. <clears throat> and we can even identify some of these stars, but some of them are fainter than the human eye can see. Oh, isn't this interesting? You saw that Secchi did use photography for solar eclipses, which of course were much brighter. But you know, he died in 1878 and he just missed out on using photography. Over there, yeah. Today are based on optical astronomy. I'm wondering if you have any opportunity to participate in a deep space. Yeah, uh, we do. Uh, at the astronomy that we do, especially <clears throat> the observational astronomy, is based on our telescope, which is an optic telescope, or telescopes that we can get time on. I should give you a little more of the sense of the, the structure of the observatory. There are 12 Jesuit priests and brothers who are scientists who were paid by the Vatican. And actually the reason we can have 12 scientists on a budget of only 3 million euros is become, because we come cheap. Uh, each of us gets a stipend of about 20,000 euros, you know, think $20,000. But because we're all living together in the same community under the same rule, that means that we can pool that money and, and we, we survive, we do okay. We also have another dozen astronomers who are not Jesuits and we don't pay them, but we give them our facilities. I mentioned Ileana Canici is one of them. <clears throat> and these can be lay people or religious men or women. <clears throat> they all have to be uh, Catholics. They all have to be approved by the, the, Pope, the papacy. 
before they can use the word Vatican. So that's 24 people. There are radio astronomers among that 24. Um, a fellow named Adam Hicks, Hinks, who is a, uh, a Jesuit priest in Canada, uh, does radio astronomy that measures the kinds of measurements that are interesting to cosmologists, for instance. But we get these people, sort of whoever is available. I don't have the ability, like a, a university department would have, to say, you know, we really need a radio astronomer. Let's see if we can hire one. Because if there's no Jesuit who happens to be a radio astronomer who's available to come to us, we're out of luck. So we get the, the, the you know, the, the luck of the draw that way. Yeah. Ooh. Fantastic. That's great. That, that, that's a detail I hadn't heard. <clears throat> Thank you. I hope the people in Zoom could hear that. But <clears throat> yes. It actually is a very practical reason. The original observatory only had a handful of people. And uh, in, 18, in 1929, <clears throat> the director died just as the Vatican was being uh, finally recognized by Italy. So the Pope, had, the Pope had to make a decision. Do we continue with the observatory out in you know, the summer home where the skies are darker? Or do we just say, okay, it had its purpose? He made the decision, we'll continue having an observatory and paying for it. But in order <clears throat> so that all of us can live together in the same community under the same rule, he said they'll all be from the same religious order. He could have chosen Dominicans or Franciscans or a lot of you know, other orders that have universities. But the previous director had been a Jesuit, Father Hagen, and Father Secchi had been a Jesuit. And the Jesuits had the most men available and the most universities. So he went to the Jesuits and said, it's your job to come up with the people who will work at the observatory. You, you, you nominate them to me and I'll accept them. The way that I became the director was that the Father General, the head of the Jesuits, nominated my name to Pope Francis, who then said yes. Yeah. Uh, I heard that you've been to Antarctica. Oh. And I, I was wondering what the scientific mission was there. There are lots of, lots of science going on in Antarctica. What I was part of, and this was back now 25, nearly 30 years ago, 1996, I work in meteorites. My real joy is the fact that you can hold pieces of outer space in your hand and, I, and, you know, relevant to Seki, I make fun of my fellow astronomers. You think you're studying galaxies and stars. All you're really studying are photons. But I get to hold the real thing. Meteorites fall everywhere equally, which means most of them land in the ocean because there's more ocean than anything else and we never get those. And those that would land in an area like this, you would never see, number one, because it's covered with all sorts of other rocks. And number two, because most meteorites have tiny flecks of iron, which immediately start to rust. And when they rust, they expand. And when they expand, they break the rock apart. And so a meteorite will turn itself into dust in about 20 years. But if you go to Antarctica, the meteorites stay frozen, so they don't rust. They're black, and the ice is white, so it's real easy to find them. And there's one more advantage. The ice actually moves like a conveyor belt, bringing all the meteorites that land into the ice to a region where there might be a blockage, like a mountain range. And that's where all the meteorites get concentrated. So for the last 50 years, there's been a regular program funded by NASA and the NSF to send a small group of people every year to the blue ice of Antarctica to collect meteorites. And uh, it's run by a fellow who's at uh, Carnegie Institute in Cleveland. <clears throat> no, um, Case Western. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Case Western in Cleveland. And I was one of those people who was, you know, lived on the ice for six weeks. 
um, nothing made me happier to come back to civilization. <laughs> Hot showers, flush toilets, what a, what, a, what a concept. But it was as close as I'll ever have been to uh, being on another planet. And of course, you make friends for life. Uh, the two women on that team, one of them is now a scientist at the Natural History Museum. She's British. Her daughter is my goddaughter. And the other went on to a pretty good career. Uh, she wound up as president of Worcester Polytechnic Institute until she quit that job to become head of JPL. So she did okay. Other questions? Uh, at, at the risk of making a nasty observation, everybody has put their hand up so far, it's been a guy. Are there no curious women in this group? I know there are, some of them very curious. Good, good. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Oh yeah, the, the Smithsonian and we collaborate a lot. There was, uh, the, the Media Ridical Society held a, uh, our meeting in Rome in 2001, the week of 9-11, as it turns out. And while there, I was showing off a very famous piece of our collection, the very important meteorite Murray to the head of the collection at the Smithsonian who said, Guy, this is a piece of terrestrial shale. This isn't a meteorite. <laughs> and so I loaned it to him and sure enough, he was right. <laughs> which you know, we discovered that in fact, a number of collections have false pieces in them. And we worked out a system for finding those false pieces using magnetic detections. But uh, we have a regular collaboration. The same guy, <clears throat> Glenn McPherson is his name, had invited me to give a talk at the Smithsonian. And I'm busy in the library preparing the talk while he and some colleagues are preparing the new exhibit they were putting together, which has now been up for a number of years about the moon and the Apollo program. And they were going to have a giant globe of the moon when you come in. And they were arguing, what's the color of the moon? And I heard them go with different books and is it yellow, is it gray? You know, it depends on how they process the photograph. And finally, Glenn says, look, why don't we call up Harrison Schmidt? He was there. <clears throat> He'd tell him to go to Sherwin Williams and find a paint chip. I don't know if they actually did that, but yeah. Uh, the Smithsonian is the largest collection in the world. Ours is about number 20. So not bad. And I know we're running short on time. I, I see that Jeff is getting a little worried, but one last question. In the back, yes. Right, how did I get there? Um, I went to the Jesuit high school in Detroit, which is where I learned the Jesuits. I was a nerd. And of course, you know, I was in kindergarten when Sputnik went up and, and senior in high school when uh, men landed on the moon. So of course, all the smart little boys in those days, not girls, stupidly enough, <clears throat> were all gonna be scientists and engineers. But by the time I got to high school, I realized that uh, there's more than that. And I actually wanted doing classics, Latin and Greek. Which is why I'm on that nomenclature committee, because they think I know Latin, but that's a whole different story. I had no idea what to do with my life after high school. Uh, my dad had grown up in Boston, so I figured I'd go to Boston and go to a, a Jesuit school there, because I like the Jesuits, so I went to Boston College. And they stuck me in the, you know, the boys' dorm, freshman men. <clears throat> More horrible creatures in the world do not exist than 18-year-old men. Boys. And they were, you know, as they were getting busy, getting drunk and doing stupid things and their lives would fall apart, then they'd come to me and to pour out their problems. And I'm thinking, why are you telling me that? Just because I don't like to drink, because, you know, it smells bad. Why would anybody want to drink that stuff? And it's expensive. You could buy chocolate, you know. <laughs> really, what's the point? And they pour out their problems. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's no surprise you've got problems. You're an idiot. <laughs> Life is tough when you're stupid. <laughs> In order to get out of the freshman dorms, I decided to become a Jesuit priest. <laughs> so I went to a Jesuit priest and I you know, explained this and he goes, well, have you prayed about this? I'm 18 years old, who prays? Give me a break. He goes, go to your room and ask God. So I go to my room and I'm waiting for the voice in the ceiling and nothing's coming. 
Instead, all the question goes like, what is a priest going to do for a living? Deal with people, people with problems, people just like the guys you're trying to get away from. <clears throat> this would be the worst job in the world. Either there is no God and I hadn't heard anything, which means it would be stupid to be a priest, or there was a God and he just told me it would be stupid for me to be a priest. <clears throat> So next best thing was, well, where am I happy? My best friend was going to MIT and they had the world's biggest science fiction collection. <clears throat> so I went there to read science fiction and I had to choose a major. And by accident, I chose planetary science, not realizing it was geology. But then I discovered that rocks are interesting when they're rocks falling out of the sky, which is how I got into meteorites. Um, by the time I was 30, I had my doctorate from Arizona. I was five years a postdoc, couldn't get a job and wondering why am I doing astronomy when people are starving in the world. So I quit MIT, I quit my job, I joined the Peace Corps. And what the Africans in Kenya wanted me to do was to tell them about astronomy because they were hungry for that. Because life is more than just filling your stomach. We don't live by bread alone. I, I'd read that someplace. <laughs> and that also taught me that I really enjoyed teaching. So I came back from Africa, got a job with Peace Corps on my resume. Suddenly I stood out. I got a teaching job at a place called Lafayette College. Best place. Oh my gosh, I love teaching there. And I was having the time of my life. But I still was lacking that sort of what else am I going to do with my life? The, the girl I'd been dating, she and I broke up. And thank heavens, because we were absolutely not right for each other. Brilliant person, but, you know, not, not right for each other. What am I going to do? Well, I remembered, you know, if I had been a Jesuit, I could teach at a Jesuit school and stand for something bigger than myself, and I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, <clears throat> getting paid and stuff like that. But God had told me not to be a priest. Oh, I remember that Jesuits also have brothers. So I asked my friends, you know, would I be crazy if I joined the Jesuits as a brother? And they all said, go for it, including my friends who didn't believe in God, including the women I used to date. <clears throat> Maybe they knew something. Well, they did. I showed up. I discovered this was the best place for me. But even as a brother, though I'm not ordained and I don't lead public prayer and I don't say mass or that sort of thing, I still have to take the same three vows, poverty, chastity, obedience. Poverty, I was used to. I'd been a grad student. Chastity, I was used to. I'd been a grad student. Obedience, I was not used to. I was ready to be sent to you know, a university like University of San Francisco or Santa Clara to teach at a Jesuit school. But I got a letter signed by Father General assigning me to Rome. Under obedience, I had to go to Rome, live in the Pope's summer palace, look at that terrible scenery, eat that horrible food, and oh yes, take care of their collection of a thousand meteorites. Remember I'd mentioned meteorites? <clears throat> That's how I got there. I've been there now 30 years. Um, I still would love to teach someday, but it's probably not going to happen. But, you know, I'm under obedience. I've got to obey. Thanks a whole lot to everybody for coming. <laughs>